Welcome to DivCasts from the University of Chicago Divinity School. For more of our podcasts and information about our terms of use, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Welcome, everybody, and please, at any time during the proceedings, if you, uh, the sound is not clear, very clear in the back, just raise your hand. And, um, it's a, it's about a pleasure for me to start off on morning proceedings. My name is Michael Sells. I'm, I teach in the Divinity School here and in uh, the Department of Comparative Literature. And uh, I'm just going to say a very few words right now about the program as such, the operational aspects. Uh, so we hope that people will be able to share many of the events and we can have a sustained conversation. We hope to have sound checks, talks, and music and refreshments. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the base, with the building, um, uh, there are restrooms in the basement. Um, and for those who want want to be looking for lunch, who may not be with the speakers, there are uh, there's food in the basement as, as well, and the coffee shop, and there's a lot of other similar uh, places to go on campus. We're having um, a reception after the event, and we hope that during that reception and during our intermissions, uh, that people will have a chance to talk with the speakers, uh, to talk uh, with one another, and to carry on the conversation informally. This is the fourth year of an initiative called the Mellon Islamic Studies Initiative. Uh, that has been bringing distinguished scholars uh, as visitors to the university. At first it started where each visitor would be here for one quarter, and now we have a new system, this is the first year of that, where our visitor, in this case Professor Horatio, is here with us for two quarters. Uh, Phil Bowman gave uh, uh, Excellent introduction to Professor Qureshi's work at her inaugural lecture here last month. And so um, there's little left for me to do in this case but to turn over the proceedings um, to uh, Professor Qureshi to open our first uh, panel and to start off our day. So, Professor Qureshi. Thanks very much. And welcome everybody who shall live. And most of all, thank you, Professor Sells, for making this all happen. It's really marvelous. And without any ado, I'd like to introduce our very first panel, which is a grand total of two, because a conversation always starts with two. And this is this whole event is really meaning to do a conversation with our guests and with each other and with all of us. So this is a very special moment in my long engagement with Islam and Sufism and its music. Actually 14 years. And it is the moment for opening a conversation that includes us all, thanks to the wonderful opportunity coming from the Melbourne Islamic Studies Initiative with support from its director, Professor Michael Sells, to create a multi vocal conversation that allows us both to, li to listen and both to speak from different perspectives, different disciplines with the hope to find new understandings toward expanding the realm of Islamic and Islamic studies. Um, sometimes I feel I'm not worthy of you know, calling myself an Islamic scholar, so, but Islamic is okay. So 
the realm of Islamic, Islamic studies in the direction of sound studies. And I'm not saying, well, I'll say music, but I, I like the trend that we have in our field, in ethnomusicology, to now accept that music is culture specific, and therefore using a more neutral term would be more, more inclusive. So the focus, our focus, of course, will be on music and its special power to mediate across disciplines and modes of thinking. So, I would now want to introduce my conversation partner, <laughs> Professor Phil Bowman. We have go back a long time, and we have always had arguments. There is always something that we can try to solve and improve, whether it is the translation of a 19th century German piece on Islam, or whether it's an issue about uh, um, between ethnog ethnographic work or philosophical work, where, where the abstractions lie, there's, we also have arguments between um, different kinds of abstractions or exegetical uh, locations. So that is all a lot of fun. Because it's because fundamentally we think the same way, and that's what makes it happen. And I think that starting like that is excellent and should inspire all of us to start talking to each other, I guess. So we therefore begin, I should actually say, although you're so famous, we don't really have to say what to do. Philip <laughs> Bowman, of course, professor here in music, and also, you also part in another faculty. At this moment, you can say I'm an associate faculty at the Divinity School. That's what it is. Yes. Yeah. So this is perfect. And we are very happy to hear about that. That's wonderful. That's really wonderful. And Phil has actually started his work in Western music, German folk music and folk music in general. And Phil has a tendency to um, do work that is specific and focused on some tradition or some practice at somewhere in the world, but then he'll also write a general um, expose which he pulled out of that particular work and become theorize it, analyze it, and make it accessible for people who are maybe working in totally different places, but they can still use that as a model. And it comes out of actual Music practice. Music practice is also what uh, is part of your life now, because you have uh, invented a music genre. Have you? Haven't you? Uh, well, <laughs> my, my detractors say that. <laughs> you have invented it because it wasn't alive. The work I do with with Jewish capital. Exactly. So that would be an entertaining sort of live to have here, but maybe that's not quite the, the event. <laughs> so thanks, thanks, Squig. Um, what, what we have in mind is a sort of movement back and forth between ideas that mirror each other but then sort of reflect things in different directions. And, and I wanted to begin locally and um, more or less in the present, in the present uh, or at least close to the present, sort of the, our, the, the world that we understand close at hand. Um, first of all, with Chicago. Um, and I remember a time in Chicago in the 1980s and 1990s when I first came to the University of Chicago to teach. Um, and I was teaching some courses both in music of the Middle East and music in South Asia. And this was the moment in which uh, Kabbalah really became world music. And, 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 and 
And, and I was struck by this because it, that, that, that wave of, of Kamali as, as world music swept across Chicago in, in, a, in, in an incredible way. I remember my students um, in, in those classes in the 1980s and 1990s saying, yes, well, doesn't this really violate Islam? You, you have Mr. Fatih Ali Khan coming and performing uh, the Rosemont Horizon in some, some, some theater with, with, with huge audiences. And, and, and sort of serving as a, as a star. And then we began to discuss, yes, but you know there are, he doesn't want, he and his troop perform not only at the Rosemont Horizon or the big stage, but they find private places, spaces where the music is devotional. And, and, and those who understand Sufism from, from this standpoint uh, uh, are Understanding that music, he plays a different repertory, although a linked repertory, a repertory in which he actually moves between the spaces in Chicago. Um, so, though to outsiders that it may have seemed at this time as if the principles of sacred music in Islam were being violated by this first wave of international Sufi musicians in the world, in fact, they moved between different worlds, in which music is devotion and music as an aesthetic experience, uh, one that may indeed aspire toward the sublime, but these actually did not represent contradictions. Regular? This is so interesting, because just last night, um, I was listening to a, a recording, an old, old recording that I have from this 1960s um, of the most popular Nath reciter, uh, Nath meaning an old Jew prophet Muhammad. And the, her name is Hume Habiba. And every, uh, there's that first recording of two poems, one of them is a Sadi poem, and everybody knows that poem. Everybody knows her rendition of it. And she, in fact, um, is the first female, not reciter, who does it in public. On the outer radio, you can see her too, you can see her too. At first, it wasn't her, her father is a, a, a Ari, that is a reciter, a Quran reciter. And when I, I said, I, I wanted to find out more about what she's doing now, and, and the big news is that she lives in Chicago. So, <laughs> so Chicago really is an amazing place. <laughs> but really, let's get back and we may be able to hear her just a little bit when we come to recitation. So I, I just wanted to say to Phil that um, what you said about the commands is exactly what they always do. And even Musa Fateani. Um, he always used to preserve the integrity of his songs. And even if he sang something in a, on a concert stage and no sheikh around, but he, he never compromised the quality and the authenticity of what he was doing. And yes, he tolerated people jumping on a stage and you know throwing money at him uh, in concert halls, but not in the really the serious, more private methods, of course, which wouldn't bring him so much money. So the, the compromise was that he had to make a living. And I, well, that's one of the things I found out, uh, <coughs> that cabals are basically very unstable economically. Even if they're really popular, and they used to say that, when I, when I get asked, I always say yes for everything, all the gigs that I might get, because um, now I'm in fashion. Two, two months later, somebody else become, becomes in, and then I might not get any, get any work. And so that is the, the, con the contradiction and the problem that I face in my, through my research while I was doing my dissertation. At one, in fact, there was a point at which 
after a year in Pakistan and in India, I came back with all my materials and I was starting to write my dissertation. I was, but I was paralyzed. I got paralyzed because it hit me so hard that what did I actually do? I spent a year getting things for myself and for my life and, and for all the wonderful people here in the West. But what, what is it that makes these performers be so extremely poor and so unsupporting? And people like myself who go as foreigners. Uh, and yes, we pay, we give gifts and everything, but then we leave. And then they're on their own. And we even tried, I mean, I always tried to to do something sensible with money that I could give him, like send his child to school. But they didn't want that. Because there's a fear that then the child is lost and he will not become a successor. I mean, and because the only way money could be made by commands is that you have to perform it. And so that's my, that is in a way what motivated me. I've always wanted to do an event where we can address both the sublime and the abject in the same event. Because that's normally never done. Either we go, the anthropologists study down and we get our hands dirty in the, in the ghettos and so on, or we are up there with the sublime. And I'm hoping that we can break that or connect those two. And I, I want to thank Katie very much for supporting that. That's where it started between the two of us and, and Phil. And in fact, we have been a committee to organize this event. So they, I owe you a treat. Thank you. Well, it was, it's actually because of your work um, with Sufi music in, in, in Pakistan that we in ethnomusicology know a great deal about the Mudi Shafa shrine in, in, in Delhi. <laughs> and so I thought because of that, I might bring us uh, in more or less in the present to that shrine. Um, and I, I, I have a video clip from a visit that I made with our colleague and PhD student in music, Amira Nimji, um, which we made in, on December 11th, um, uh, 2014, only, only two months ago. And the two of us are sitting here, immediately you can see behind the, almost with the kavas, and um, at the shrine itself. And I'm going to play this and then to say a few words about, about this particular example. It's a Thursday evening
most of you, some of you will actually recognize this particular piece. It's a song which is called La Maricat, or sometimes known as Dam Dam Mast Kalandar. Uh, if you recognize it, I suspect it's because you've heard it in the performance by Musrat Fatih Ali Khan. Um, and uh, in fact, it's very likely that, that this group of Kalas learned this performance because they, it bears many of the performance aspects of Musrat Fatih Ali uh, Khan's um, uh, performance. And, and in this sense, it's rather remarkable in a certain sense. Uh, because of the way it shows a kind of exchange uh, within the spaces of Delhi, of the shrine itself, you notice already the complex of spaces um, here as well. Um, uh, it's, it's a moment, but it's a moment that's, that reaches out and reflects many other moments uh, as well. It's a, it's a, again, a version of this song is, has been using the Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan's version it's well known, the Pakistani rock group Jadun, for example. Um, the moment itself at Nizamuddin Shrine represents the ways in which music opens the path, and perhaps at times closes the path for movement between different spaces of performance and worship, the sacred and the secular. Regal and I were speaking of this earlier in the week as if there was a sacred geography that we might observe formed from the intersection of four processes. Um, one, well, maybe the spatiality, two, the temporality, three, the materiality as well, and four, the sublime as well. Regular, you spoke very eloquently about the ways in which temporality was also shaped through genealogy. Um, and genealogy, in this sense, might and maybe must have both sacred and secular dimensions, and I wonder if you can comment a little bit about that. Certainly, certainly. Um, I've spent a lot of time in Delhi, and just like same states in Spain or wherever there are. So uh, there are, it is a huge celebration, you can say, because the de death of any Sufi, it means that he's now united with God. So it's a, it's a time to rejoice. But what's really important is none of these events, the public events, um, the Kavali events, especially when there is a special occasion. It cannot happen without somebody reciting the genealogy, the spiritual genealogy that goes all the way from the present of the two, Hazrat Ali and uh, the Prophet. That, to me, is and then is more than just a lot of names. And of course, that I mean, the genealogy is an embodiment of the space and of the belonging that is absolutely un unquestionable for, for the cabals, because many cabals, of course, um, have no, they come as visitors. And I don't know who these people were, but they look like locals. So locals means that they have a hereditary right. Any time they can come and sing, and therefore also they can burn and, and make a living that way. That's maybe not your sort of sublime way of looking at genealogies. It's very down to earth. But there's more to it. I mean, the question might be whether the down to earthness is really critical to having the sublime. Exist in this relation between between the, 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 the two as well. I, it, it's to, to me that is a big question because I, part of me says sacred. No, the songs aren't sacred. I'm not sure if there is anything that is sacred. Somehow the concept is very Christian. It just doesn't quite work. Muslims, I don't know. I see you kind of nodding your head. 
what do you say? I've been around you, many of you working with Muslims, run into that. I, I can never quite explain to a Muslim who, 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 where I would like to say this is sacred. No, it's mm -hmm. not really. I mean, a mosque isn't sacred. God isn't in the mosque, actually. At least that's what I want. My understanding is, and then it's always a question, um, what do we do with our understanding in order to make it match? But it's also true that the conversation, I think, has to happen because we are not any more insular. Neither are the ones. They are not insular either. And maybe part of our job is not to just do what um, we have done as traditional scholars, is to maintain, help maintain how it was the past. And this is where I see a, a, a big question about time. Do we, do, do we follow the traditional scholarly approach where anyone who sings popular or they mix tunes uh, or they do something that isn't traditional, then we, we, we exclude that. It's not part of what we have in our paradigm. I certainly, my work has been like that. I absolutely, many years until I looked at popular music, popular kabbali. So what do we do about this? It's one of the big questions. Heritage um, or, or that, that's what comes to mind is the whole René Guénon group, the, the group of people who found a, a kind of Islam, a kind of, uh, a kind of Sufism that enabled them to get out of particularly the, the realms of the Catholic Church and the, the ritual, you know, the structure and so then those who don't agree with that will say this is destroyed, this is a destructive approach. On the other hand, what who are we to judge? I think at this time, because there is so much interaction globally, uh, that's a big question that I hope we can discuss more and find out what what you find, what what is possible. What can we improve? Can we just let the scholarship be open? Because once that happens, and the, the interest, the, what interests me here is that these European Sufis, the one thing that they have held on to is initiation to a sheikh and being part of a genealogy, a spiritual genealogy. Other rituals they don't practice. So, what do we do about that now? Well, one of the things I thought we might do is put some other people in the conversation here. Absolutely. Um, and particularly between Europe and, and the, the different areas of Islam, and different, and different historical periods, because one of the things, one point we might consider as we go through the day is whether ideas about the sublime actually emerge from these conversations. I want to put a couple people in conversation, um, and, and, and to do so, first of all, I'm going to put, uh, put, this, put something up, and Katie, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to switch computers, but I'll just put this up to 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 where this computer. Um, uh, I wanted to put. The, um, to a conversation that was ongoing uh, in the late Enlightenment, a conversation between Immanuel Kant and his student, Johann Gottfried Herder, um, in which they develop an idea about the sublime in music. Uh, and this is quite fascinating to me because the ideas in which, which they develop have resonances with other ideas that are, that are, that are being stated with you know, that begin already in medieval treatises, uh, from in, in, in Persian, of course, in Arabic as well. 
Um, so I want to do this. I, I started first to give this example, this, this idea of the movement between, if you will, the ground, um, even the abject, and you notice the ideas of the abject here that are part of this path toward, toward, watched, toward this final stage in which one, one reaches that end of, 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 of God's love uh, that, that, that the Sufi path takes. Um, and, and of course, this here, this is a, I, I put this together, sort of pulling a number of different um, uh, passages from Anamur Shimmel and uh, Navid Kamani, uh, who have been among those of, of my guides, especially connecting, connecting the European thinking specifically to Islamic thinking. But I wanted to, to read uh, a passage, just two passages, one from Herada. Um, this is from the conversation he had in 1800, the year 1800, in, in a volume called Kalegone. Um, a conversation, actually a kind of debate that he has with Immanuel Kant. Um, and this is a passage from a chapter called uh, Von Musik on Music. Let me read it to you just to get the sense, and you might wonder if this is a Sufi actually writing this passage at this moment. Devotion is blind to the person who is singing. The musical tones come from heaven. They resonate within the heart, and the heart itself sings and plays. In this way, the musical tone from a string that has been set in motion or from small pipes into which one blows is able to resonate freely in the air, so that it is grasped by every sensitive being, and it resonates everywhere, renewing itself in the struggle against sustaining itself, able to communicate anew. Devotion arises in this way, born by sound, pure and free, moving across the face of the earth, enjoying everything in the singular, in each tone sensing the harmony of all tones. In this way, devotion sensitizes itself to every little dissonance, feeling in the narrow range of our few melodic styles and scales all vibrations, movements, modes, and accentuations of the spirit of the world, of, all, of an all-encompassing world. Might one therefore ask that music, through its inner efficacy, surpasses each art that expresses itself through the visible. It must surpass them, just as the spirit surpasses the body. For music is spirit, related to the power of the innermost strength, that of movement. What cannot be made visible to, to the human will Communi communicates to us in its own way, and in its own way alone, revealing the world of that which is not visible. It speaks to us, moving us with true impact. We ourselves, does anyone know how? Sense this impact without opposition, but with real power. Um, we might think of this when we're, when we, when we compare it to um, a writing by Mohammed Taki Shali Shariati and Mazzinani, uh, which is gathered by Kiamani. Uh, and I just I just read this passage to compare um, in which one is talking about the impact of Sama, of hearing, experiencing sound in the Sufi assembly. And I quote again now. If all of those learned in music and those who are teachers were to gather in order to compose a melody from 28 letters of the Arabic alphabet without building upon the words, they would be entirely unable to do so. Can you make the transfer? The diverse, multitudinous, and harmonic melodies have an enormous realm of meanings because of the complex ways in which words and meanings are woven together in the Quran. It is with a view on this remarkable characteristic of the Quran that the Prophet and those of his remarkable genealogy offer decisive and conclusive advice about how melodies were to be taken from the Arabs and then adapted to the Quran. Perhaps with that in mind, that this conversation, this conversation between different thinkers, 
the different ideas of musical thought between different religions. Herder, writing, was a pastor, a Lutheran pastor by training, or a philosopher. Perhaps you might, you can carry this conversation a bit more to some of your conversations with your musicians uh, over many years. It's amazing, and the, I think we touched with this passage, we touched on something very cent central, whether for, for very central for musicians and for those who value music, give it a value. Is music coming out of a person? Is it the musician who creates that message? Or is that message transcendental and it comes through the musician, but it's not his? And certainly with the cabals, a cabal is only a messenger. He is the way um, it was put to me is he's like the young man with a train with gifts for a wedding. And so he's been sent from the the house where that wedding is going to happen, to bring these gifts to those who are invited. And that gift is absolutely, I mean, that gift, and have, it, that gift is not dependent in any way of the musician. The musician is just the, the carrier of the tree. And that always touched me because these are, these are not the kind of popular singers. These are very serious, very well-trained singers who feel very seriously what they offer. And what's more is, I've, I've known this, I knew about several cabals that they are really Sufi themselves. And so I would ask, I ask my teacher, no, I'm not. I'm a cabal. I'm just a singer. I'm not a singer. And that is, it's as if you shouldn't be a singer. Because that will get in the way. He explained to me. Well, in fact, one of my, one of the, the chefs told me, yeah, yeah, that there was one of the, the singers in, at, at the shrine. And <coughs> he, would become, he would be overcome. And his tears would come when he's singing certain verses. Well, that's very really inconvenient because then he wasn't, you know, he got involved with that gift. Well, that wasn't his gift. He's only, he's only the transmitter, so he should just forget about being a Sufi. That's not, he can't do that. And what I realized what, um, is that the incredible power of social classes in India and Pakistan, that so your social identity, if, you, if it's low and if it's tied to a profession, well, then that is who you are. And you have no right to question it. And even though in Islam there is no such that thing as you know, being born and having, having a destiny that is already Made. No, you have free will. But in, in essence, it's just, it comes out the same. So this has always disturbed me. And that is another subject, and it's another aspect of that relationship that we need to explore between those who do, who, who do the labor and those who receive the gift. Do you want to share with us some of Yes, that's so wonderful. Um, these would be two clips. One is uh, what actually happens in a summer in, in one of those gatherings. And this is uh, one that is very intimate. There are such gatherings, and that's actually at the shrine, at the large Nizamuddin shrine. There are some small, uh, they're called Hudra, I mean, like retreat places or places where um, a sheikh would be sitting and receiving people who have need, spiritual needs. So this is a small group and they are in a, one of those small groups. And what we're seeing 
Yeah, is it visible? Yeah. yeah. Do you want me to play it right now? Almost. Um, what was so amazing about this is that this actually was an experience where one of the disciples of this group, he's an older man, he actually was overcome by a verse and he really um, was filled with an ecstasy and with that, what they call much, an ecstatic state or a gift, it's really a gift, a divine gift that you never know who gets it and when. But when it happens, there are also people who come in Nizamuni who are clearly not receiving any gift, but they're kind of making themselves important by starting to stand up and you know wave their arms. And, and so that also happens. And this is where the, stru the structure, uh, the ritual structure, um, is, takes care of this because there is always a sheikh or there is a meal and a hill, somebody who is spiritually responsible for the gathering. And so you will see that this, the one man, you see him from the back, he's looking at the leader, the sheikh is the leader straight ahead with a certain scarf on. And when, when the disciple is beginning to be very agitated, um, nobody gets up, nobody stands up, people just sit. And it is up to the sheikh to decide when is, when can he be sure that this is really a genuine, uh, you could say, a genuine experience of having uh, an intuitive gift that comes from above in, and um, enriches this one person. And in, by being with that one person who is going into a trance, that affects everybody. It's a gift for everyone who's there. And so what, ha what must happen is that the sheikh, when he sees that this is really happening, this is really serious, then everybody, he stands up. And when that's the signal that everybody else stands up. Because the person who is in the trance is also going to be standing up. And so standing up means every, it's, it's as if, in fact, it's as if time stops flowing. It, now it is a, a moment, a time moment, that is not moving. Everybody is just like that. And um, I, I, it took me a long time to really be able to understand this and make sense for myself of this. Because time just keeps going. I mean, the, the, at least the, the Christian time I know, time, you cannot go out of time, really. Because unlike the Christian situation, in, in the Muslim concept of time, time is not, time is part of creation. And when something divine happens, time stops. It actually is stopped because the time is stopped. And uh, I actually wrote an article on this at one point and took, spent the whole summer just trying to find out how to think about this. So here we go. When they all stand, no money is being offered either. It's a very bad moment for the cabals. But their duty is that they have to keep singing that same little verse that over and over, as long as that trance continues, because this is actually a life and death matter. There are many instances and accounts and poems that someone who did not receive that nourishment from that song, they died. But someone will die. And that danger is there. So this is the supreme responsibility that the Kabbalah has, that we must continue to see. <coughs> Which means that then somebody else, like for instance, my husband, who was there with me, that he was, we don't see him. But he would, he was there and he, he was always a generous person when good poetry was being sung. Uh, 
and, and naturally then when the cabals are seeing him or someone like him, they hope that he would make a, general, a generous offering to help their pity at home when they're so poor. Well, when everyone is standing at the moment of, of the trance is happening, um, sorry, I mean, nobody can take out a coin or anything. They have to set, they just have to be obedient and accept this gift. So you will see how what happens. Uh, can also carefully watch on the right side. <clears throat> there is somebody, there's now a black piece there, but there is a man who, a senior person who is, belongs to the shrine community. And there is a point at which uh, the cabals are trying to start up a new line of the song, something different that would be in Persian. Farsi is very important this weekend, I think. So they're singing, they start singing a Persian verse because that is serious, very serious poems, poetry, more serious than the Hindi kind of slightly popular poetry. This is actually a Hindi song. So as he starts up and right away, the man on the right, you can't see it very well, but you can see him going like this, his finger. That's all he has to do. No, not saying anything, not saying, going up to him, no, just, and immediately he switches back to the song he should be singing to support that man in trance, who by the way was a poor man.
much. Thank you for sharing this 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 work from your from your own past as well, and, and the way that that has uh, influenced your thinking. Um, I want just to say a few words in conclusion, um, but of course, in conclusion, it leads to the rest of the day. Uh, to come again to this question of the sublime. I, I really believe that this elevation of the sublime to an aesthetic realm marked by music has resulted from a number of different passages into multiple worlds, which we've been discussing from the beginning of our conversation, really. The sacred and the secular, of course, that relationship is very important. But so, too, is the emergence of new narratives of modernity, history, that aspect of temporality in which events history in a, in a contradictory sense. The aesthetic of the sublime aspires them to the universal because of, not despite, its apparent contradictions. Accordingly, it might draw many, whether Sufi, Muslim, or a human being drawn to experiencing the intimacy of Sufi music. It might draw all of us closer to the sublime. Thanks very much for including me in this conversation. Before we have our uh, next stage, uh, could we, I'd like to suggest we take five minutes so that anyone who wants to refresh their uh, coffee could, and in five minutes we'll start up. Yes, are you getting any questions? Yes. Um, there, there's, uh, shall we take any questions? Um, well, let's take two questions, since there are two people that uh, uh, wanted to ask questions. Let's take two questions, and that'll be part of the five minutes, so other people can be getting coffee and carry on the conversation, and I will let uh, our two uh, uh, conversants uh, field questions. So please, in the back. Is there any uh, concerning this, the notion of the sublime? Uh, and I've been a professor, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, you mentioned that you referred to Kant. And I'm thinking about the, uh, the Christian tradition of music making, let's say Bach writing choral music for the Christian or Christian based church, which is a very conscious and organized intellectual effort. And um, is there, a, is there a cognitive aspect understanding the presence or absence of, of the sublime in Muslim music versus Christian music, for example? Hmm. Is, is, is the sublime an intellectual concept, do you think, perhaps more and, and, and more driven, more based in Western thought? So, the, the, the point that I was trying to make by, by drawing Herder and Kant in this conversation is that they were part, of, they too were part of a much larger conversation. Um, and and Bergdahl was talking about the way in which European Sufis had certain concepts that then were both specific to their historical trajectory, but then, and, but then related to certain Sufi uh, concepts also throughout the Mediterranean world, the Middle East, and, and South Asia as well. So, 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 so the, the relationship between specific and general, in, in that passage that I wrote, it was specifically about devotion. In other words, but it wasn't about devotion of, of, of particular Christological texts or, or repertory, but rather about music in general. And I think that was the, that's the really critical thing. And that's the point that the discussion of music is something which may relate to devotion and religion, but also expands that notion. I don't say it departs from it, it expands that notion of uh, when it moves towards it. Uh, yeah, but my question is a little related because um, you made the point that you know, the sacred as a notion is a suspect outside of the Christian context. And the conference is basically seems to accept that the sublime is very central to Sufi music. So, and the question just now basically uh, asked whether, you know, even the sublime, whether it's applicable outside the Western context. 
So how do you distinguish, how do you, you know, define the sublime, how do you distinguish the sublime from the sacred? I mean, what is the, the words are overlap in some respects, but at the same time there's clearly some distinction like in the context of the conversation and the conference. I'm not sure if, for me at least, the sacred and the sublime, uh, maybe they are, you know, they could be. But um, I was thinking, or you know, what, what, what reminded, it reminds me when I see this video is when I'm sitting in the, you know, Romanesque cathedral in Basel, Switzerland, and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the Missa Solemnis, uh, one of the great works. And, and the way that sounds and that entire com complex and the sublime is all over me. I mean, and that sublime is actually not just sounds. It is a co it's a constellation in which I grew up, which I was trained in. There is intellectual, there is definitely an intellectual component behind it, um, which you know, my theological family was sure I got. And, and this is something that I think really has, preparing for this has really started, pointed out to me that the, the middle class educated um, bourgeois uh, people who, became, who left the church and went to Africa to find someone to initiate them, they are very much caught in an intellectual tradition and um, that their sublime, I mean my sublime too, but rarely would I experience moments where the mind wasn't also at work. And this is I think a big difference that that, um, that the sacred is something that is controlled in our brains. There are a lot of controls, that's what I noticed. But I'd like to advise you more, more and more about what your way of seeing this, because I've already been away from it for so long, you know. For me, it's a wonderful memory. Thank you. I hope that we could continue on weaving these themes and these questions into our conversations throughout the day. So, um, with the uh, a great thanks to our conversants for opening it up on such a thoughtful note. And um, we'll move on to our next panel. Um, we thank you for listening to or viewing our podcast. For more information and for other podcasts, please see our website, divinity.uchicago.edu slash podcasts. Copyright, the University of Chicago Divinity School.